All right. Um, hello. So uh, we're Intel Robotics. This is like a, our own robotics team between us two. And so the name Pinto comes from uh, Pinto Bean. If you know about the squirrel, um, that's pretty famous last year. And so basically, we're trying to resurrect Pinto. And um, so our project is building a robotic squirrel. And um, yeah, so we're looking on campus, looking at um, how um, squirrels sort of behave, what like their most like characteristic behaviors are. And uh, it seems to be like, so one major one is being able to jump from the ground to a tree. So moving between two uh, perpendicular surfaces. And so once you're able to do, do that with enough agility, then you can also jump between like branches, stairs, and things like that. So the main challenge is getting that like instantaneous power to jump up and grabbing on and just having the agility to maneuver very fast. And this is just one, um, just like the first try we did. So you can see it's not that related to this course at this moment, but um, hopefully at the end, um, we'll show some app possible applications that might be interesting. All right, so this is actually my favorite picture generated all time by Chris. Uh, and we used the knockoff engineering potato method and we named it engineering peanut method. <laughs> so uh, basically we break down the motion into five, uh, like five parts. And since our robot has uh, two links and one joint in the middle, that's the reason why I kind of call it peanut. Um, so um, in order to uh, finish all these motions, uh, we have uh, eight degrees of freedom on the robot um, with, um, with a degree of freedom in the middle so that the robot can be like flexing. Um, and um, we made substantial progress on uh, every one of these five steps, but we are not able to accomplish any of them yet. Um, and if you argue we can fly, but seriously, we don't have a flight control. <laughs> All right, and so, yeah, so this is the robot. This is our first Pinto. And uh, let's turn it on now. Can I ask you to stop this? Can I take your, do you mind? Uh, sure. Is there... Just a second, please. Yeah, hopefully it works. Um, so these are the arms. And this thing I'm holding is a joystick. So it has, it has uh, four of these like replacement Xbox thumbsticks. And then as you move them, it moves each of the four joints. Oh, so like that. And so we're able to like move like that. And so the reason why it's like a stick like this is because in order to have full control of all four limbs, um, and have like it's direct control. So it's not like you just push a joystick and it goes forward. You actually have full control of each of the joints. Um, I don't want to jump off the table. <laughs> okay. So, um, and also the back looks like this. And um, it can move up and down. Let me just hold it. This is tight. Uh, well, let's try walking. Okay, so it doesn't work that well, um, but you'll see. It also takes a bunch of like hand coordination. Oh no. Oh, okay. Not a happy squirrel. <laughs> Aha, well done. <laughs> Can 
So yeah, we don't have like an autonomous controller, at least like we don't have like a walking cycle program, but uh, you can see the hardware is there. And so let me hold it right here. And also it can sort of do a jump. It doesn't really balance, so like Can I ask you? Firstly, guys, I think you should join me just in person group. Congratulations. <laughs> this is a self initiated project where they managed to get venture capitalist funding to do this. No support from the university in that respect. Guys, can I ask you, would it be possible just to walk around so that people can see your little uh, squirrel called Pinto <laughs> up close and personal? And do you mind just sure. um, manipulating it? Actually, how about at the end? Because we have some slides about Absolutely. Absolutely. Interested. Absolutely. Please. Can I disconnect the camera? Let's do it. You can. Oops. Should be fine. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not broken. Oh. Head broke. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, I think it's just the enclosure for the uh, like remote control. So it should be fine. There's a lot of 3D printing here, that's for sure. <laughs> Okay, we'll put the head back on and then you can look at it after the slide. Chris, can you All right. Then we'll okay, so here are some. This is just how it works. We have a few slides. Um, if you're curious. Yeah. So uh, uh, the following few slides will be the mechanical design aspect of this robot. So the one that you see here is the backpack, um, which is actually this part. Um, we previously have a bevel gear actuated design with two degrees of freedom, but now we switch to a direct drive, um, direct drive uh, uh, this string driven by a brushless DC, and the pitch control is managed by a servo. Yeah. So this is a single-legged jump just from this thing, and so, yeah. So the way it works is just a string contracts here and pulls it like a muscle. It looks like a squirrel. <laughs> and here's the gripper design. So the so we're able to climb onto a tree, and this is the eventual goal. So we have to climb and then go like this and just hang there. Uh, so this the way, reason why it's able to hang is because it has sharp fish hooks on uh, all four limbs, and each finger is sprung, so it moves back and forth, and it can conform to whatever shape this tree is. And this is just a flexor, so that means um, it's sort of like a parallelogram here, and so the barb is always facing down, even if you rotate it up and down. So that's sort of like a, I guess, an interesting thing that um, like this finger has. And um, so this is a front leg design. Uh, it has um, like a two degrees of freedom here, and it's able to move like a shoulder and an elbow. And this is how we're able to move it like that. And um, so I guess um, um, sort of an important thing about this project is the how we get the power, convert the electrical power into mechanical power. Um, this is done using a brushless motor it's not very common in these um, like legged robots. Usually, they're like hobby servo motors. Um, you might have seen them in like um, they just like blocks that like move back and forth like this very slowly. And so, brushless motors are a lot more powerful 
And the hard part about using brushless motors is you have to get one of these drivers, which is really big comparative, uh, comparative to the uh, robot. Um, but so I guess one major innovation here is that we designed our own uh, brushless motor controller here, um, which is less than half the size. And so it's just a lot more convenient. And, but it has the same power output. So that means we're able to get these um, powerful jumps. Uh, so how do we jump higher? So the, right now it jumps like that high maybe, um, but we want to be able to actually jump like a squirrel, just like like that high. Uh, so the one way, I guess like theoretically, the goal is to try to jump as high as possible, so get the highest like lift off velocity. But there's only a limit on the motor power and also how long the leg can extend. So basically, you have some velocity curves, and then the integral underneath, the area underneath this curve is the position, is the leg extension. So you have a limited area, but you want maximum velocity. So that means the optimal curve of velocity would have to be concave downwards. So it goes low, 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 and then super high. And so that's sort of like a theory, and then this is the math, I um, can talk about it later, but not right now. And using that theory, this is our new leg. Uh, so the way this works is it stores some energy. And so it has two of these fiberglass springs here. And so like normally, so the, normally this, this is the leg. The leg doesn't move, actually. I do like this. This is the leg. The leg doesn't move. Uh, but the motor is able to wind up the spring oh. and lash like that. So, um, and then you can also reset it. Then, next jump. It's also series elastic, so bouncy. Uh, yeah, so. And here are some videos. This is sort of like the working prototype. <coughs> One end is the input, and the other end is the output, and there's a latch in the middle. So that means it winds at the spring, and when it hits a certain point, the other end releases super fast. And this is the leg moving, because this is not motorized. Right so this is like a walking cycle, that then, and then here is like a jump sort of backwards. And next one. So they're both, the latches are independent. So that means if we time them, we can uh, jump in different directions. This is at almost the same time. So it's like almost mm -hmm. a straight jump. And so theoretically, we can jump about a meter high since we're storing about uh, five joules of energy inside these springs. Um, so it should do a lot better than this one. Okay, and so yeah, why sh should we build this, or like, does it have any use? Um, well, honestly, like, I started this project just because I wanted to build a squirrel. It doesn't like I didn't have this goal at the beginning, but I think it would be really cool if you can use this, for example, um, like maintenance and inspection of um, like sort of things that where it's inconvenient to send people or. Like, for example, drones would be too hard to send there if they're in the trees or something. Um, so this example, uh, we have, um, so this is one issue that they're trying to solve in Indonesia with building general thermal power plants. Um, so you can see that 42% of potential geothermal resources are in protected forest areas. So that means it's harder to get uh, like permits and interest, and also it's just more expensive to maintain because it's in like that sort of place. That you first need to clear the trees and then build the thing, and every so often, like send out like inspector leaks, things like that. Um, but this can be done with something like a squirrel, which can climb basically anywhere in that terrain. And um, like for inspection, all you need is sort of like one of these sensors, and the squirrel can probably carry that around. 
Uh, second thing is it can also be used for wildlife uh, tracking and like observation. Um, so lantern flies are these things and they're invasive in North America because they eat like food crops, they infect the trees, and um, they like it grows a fungus that kills the tree. So um, one thing that people are looking at is what animals eat this uh, lantern fly. But um, so it's hard to look at, hard to see like a bird eating a lantern fly. Um, there's a site, uh, iNaturalist, and there's like a survey on there that's um, like if you see some like a bird eat a lantern fly, you can report it. Uh, but it's been so that in this article, it's been one year after the thing has been released, and there are only 78 observations. Um, so maybe if we have robots out there in the forest looking at things, uh, then we might be able to do a bit better than that. Thank you very much. I still don't have a voice. Can I just use this? Guys, congratulations. Absolutely awesome. Um, do you have any questions for this phenomenal team about their novel idea? You said this has nothing to do with the course. It has everything to do with the course. These little motors that you use have uh, neodymium magnets, which you have in electric cars. Um, you've got a lithium ion battery going here. <laughs> We can stretch it quite far, but any questions, guys? Any comments? Because if you don't, I've got quite a few. Did you have your hand raised? Oh, please. Um, Ariaman, could you, would you mind just passing the microphone back, please? Thank you. Oh, um, thank you very much. And it's a really lovely and exciting ro robot. I'm just curious, like, what do you estimate to be the cost of um, all the hardwares and also the cost of assembly? of this single um, Pinho one, is it right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so most of this is 3D printed. Mm -hmm. and So that's pretty cheap as if you have a 3D printer. Um, if you're saying like manufacture it like large scale, it's probably really cheap to manufacture the, the plastic components. Um, the most expensive part is probably the battery and the motors and the motor driver. So, uh, These four things, these three things. The battery is pretty tiny. Um, this is like twenty dollars. It's thirty dollars. Thirty. Thirty dollars for two. Okay, thirty dollars for two, and then yeah. this one is twenty dollars for the motor. Then there's two of them in this robot, and maybe thirty dollars for a motor driver. This is our own, so and it took thirty dollars to buy all the components and it's like make it in labor at maybe like fifty dollars. Um, so the whole thing maybe like two hundred or three hundred. So we did them broke a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so like during development um, we actually we spent about six hundred dollars in like this semester building this thing. Uh, this particular thing like maybe two hundred dollars. Chris can ask you thank you. Um, <clears throat> the parts are apparently not that expensive. How many hours have you collectively spent on this project, approximately? Um, yeah, so I, I spent like this entire gap semester working on it. Like, and I'm sure it's maybe, 12 hours a day. <laughs> 14 not, hours a day. Not that, uh, it's like, I'd say like less than a full-time job, but like... Okay. Yeah. Multiply that by so many hundred dollars an hour, and then I think you get a better estimate of what the project really costs. Guys, this is phenomenal. I really appreciate it. Do you mind leaving this here for the time being? Can I ask you guys just to take a seat, if you don't mind, because I'd love to do something with you in the class in the next five minutes. Do you mind? Again, thanks a lot, Jack and Chris.